I wanted to, um, first of all, just tell you about the sort of the genesis of uh, our organization getting involved in the closets industry, and it happened many years ago um, in our continual work with custom woodworkers and cabinet makers. Um, it became very apparent that the niche of closets in a home organization was was just really kind of untapped. And uh, so much so that we decided to launch a magazine dedicated to the closets and home organization and also um, a website and, uh, and, and also an event, the Closets uh, Conference and Expo, which actually will be held in 2023 in March, or no, in April in uh, West Palm Beach, Florida. But uh, so it's a, it's really a, a, a niche that needs a lot of, uh, you know, these different kinds of thinking uh, for, for those of you that are um, specialized in, let's say, traditional kitchen cabinet manufacturing or other niches of architectural woodworking or not. But um, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Leland Thomasette of Taconic Woodworking and Pauline Closet because he's literally made that uh, leap into the closets and home organization business and I wanted to uh, uh, thank him for joining us today and uh, Leland let, let the crowd know what uh, what it takes and uh, your experiences and what you've learned and uh, everything else that goes into it so good morning everybody glad to see so many people here um, so I'd like to start off with just a little bit of history about how I started my company um, and how we eventually ended up doing closets and then we'll get into uh, more of the nuts and bolts and, and some of the items that you might want to consider in making this change. So I started my company in 1989, uh, we're 10 years before that as a cabinet maker. We, Taconic Woodworking, produced custom residential cabinetry and millwork. Back then, somebody came to us with drawings and there was crazy millwork. I wouldn't do anything, you know, we, we would just machine, mold, make doors, make crazy assemblies, staircase paneling, um, and we had a blast doing it. Um, we did everything for everyone. So as years went on, uh, we got more focused on our custom cabinetry and just wanted to focus on processing panels, um, which is what we were doing best. Uh, maybe outsourcing more of our of our cabinet doors, molding stuff that my building, just to give you a little physical background, is basically about 30 feet wide and 100 plus feet long, so it makes up about 4,000 square feet. And there's usually about four people in there. Um, in 2007, we decided to automate our operation with a CNC. We bought a five by 10, three axis CNC. It had a separate drill head on it, so we put my nine spindles into nine drill bits into that. We had the long axis of our table set up with our line boring bits, and the X axis we have set up with in boring bits for the closets, which came along later. We have uh, a 20 millimeter bit for a ray fix fastener, a 15 millimeter bit for uh, cabin AO fasteners, so we were pretty flexible with what we could just leave set up in that block, plus our tool changer. Uh, and with the products we can produce. So 2007, we bought this nice shiny CNC, we are like, let's go, we had a couple big jobs, and then 2008, lo and behold, the, the economy crapped out. And we were still busy, we, we had an inventory of work, but by 2009, that was softening, and I came up with a brilliant idea, we'll, we'll create a website, uh, Taconic Woodworking CNC Services, and we'll machine parts for other shops. And there was actually a need back then because some of the big boys down in the Bronx and Brooklyn hadn't automated. They were still pretty much old school cabinet shops, a slider, an edge bander, uh, but not any automation. And they found themselves in the same position we were in where they were getting less work, laying off employees, but they still did have some work. And they had a need, and that was to get their panels produced. And they also had a need to fix the price, you know, fix the cost of, of machining those panels. Um, and then they realized they could come to us with their hardware package, and that all could be machined to, into the panels. So we started producing cabinet parts. And it actually really floated us through the uh, recession. 
So 2010 through 2011, we started getting busy with our own work again, doing whole houses, and the closet market was starting to heat up. Uh, it wasn't already rocking and rolling. And we found that uh, we were doing these jobs with contractors we had worked before with, but ro whole rooms were being turned into a master closet now. And your regular 10 foot reaching closet was now you know, a reaching closet, not with a shelf and a pole, but it had double hanging, long hanging, some shelves and then maybe drawers in the middle and a little 10 foot closet. So what happened is we weren't getting those parts of the job. So now there's a closet company on the job. There's the kind of woodworking. There might be a flooring company on the job. Um, the closet companies were also picking up some of the laundry rooms, pantry, mud room. So it became obvious that maybe we should do this. We have the machinery, we have the basic knowledge. So we added to our software, we use Cabinet Vision. Um, we bought the closet module, much simpler to use, actually pretty cool how easy it is to use. Uh, and we started building closets for our customers. We started word of mouth. You know, we're, hey, we're gonna do closets too. We did, oh, I have closets, great. You know, do our closets for us. So for, I'd say probably for the next three or four years, Everything in our closet business was word of mouth, but we were noticing a trend that we were doing a lot better percentage profit-wise on our closet systems compared to our cabinetry. Um, in 2014-15, we decided, hey, let's take this to the next level and let's market ourselves as a closet company. We didn't want to change the kind of woodworking. We had great customers. So we came up with Falling Closet Company. Falling's a nice little suburb town outside of Manhattan, quite wealthy. Um, people in town were in love with the idea that they had their own closet company, their own closet company. Um, so we started marketing it, marketing that company as Falling Closet Company. It was, oh. it's on my brain. <laughs> <laughs> um, we started marketing as Paul and Classic Company to build our own regional brand. We just set it up as a DBA to our existing business. The checks are still made out to the kind of we're working. It was quite simple to do, inexpensive to do. Um, but now we had our own brand, what we're building. I hacked around with social media and marketing, and as time went on, I was feeling that we were getting more and more work. It was becoming part of a business and that it was very process driven. And I was finding a nice side effect was that as the labor force got more difficult, uh, difficult in the matter of being able to bring people into our business that were true journeyman cabinet makers, that perhaps I could hire somebody maybe that just wanted to make a career change and teach them the process of closets much more simply than I could teach them the process of manufacturing cabinetry. So, we got a little more serious about it in 2019 and we hired a marketing firm to uh, really build the brand for us. And one of their tasks was to create a marketing playbook. Basically something that I could use or eventually if I want to sell my company that the next owner could use as to how we create all this social media and how we keep that look and feel consistent, right? You don't want to look like this on Facebook and like that on a AdWords I mean, it's nice to have, and with any marketing, you want to look consistent to your customers. Um, that has really made the closet company part of our business explode. And now what I'll do is I'll go through basically how we got there. Can everybody hear me all right? I know I have a booming voice. Okay, so first things first. We have uh, three axes nested base CNC, that's what we use for our cabinetry. So basically all of the work that we do are gonna be on the front and back sides of this panel, uh, of the panel. Um, we're not gonna do any edge work with this machine. Um, so, and we have the drill, which is nice, especially for closets, because there's lots of drilling. Um, and we have an edge bander. We did upgrade the edge bander as we got further into our closet business, business because I basically had a full-time position for somebody cleaning parts coming off of our old SEMI. So it, it became obvious that that was probably cheaper to make a monthly payment for five years and to continue to watch my, my 
my prize employee polishing panels and scraping glue. Um, we had again that 28 foot wide footprint made it necessary that we have a fairly compact edge bander um, and they've gotten even more compact with pre-mill scraping buffing. So you, you want to have, if you can, an edge bander that's going to do the work for you. You don't want to be spending a ton, a ton of time afterwards. There's always a little bit of white down and clean up, but that's important. Now that I've said that, I don't want anybody to become discouraged. You can certainly build closets with more traditional cabinetry, uh, manufacturing equipment, a slider, a vertical panel saw, um, perhaps a, a, what I would call a manual boring machine where you're not CNC aided, you're, you're setting up stops. It's just gonna be more difficult in repeatability and, and coming back if you wanna make an additional part or repeating exactly what you've already done. With the CNC, you just pull up the program for the part, drop it onto a thumb drive, take it to the machine, and you get the same part you had last time. But it, it's not impossible. Some other options, okay, we talked about three axis, and this is this is going to make more sense in a few minutes when we look at fastener types. Like now how how are you going to attach your partitions to all your horizontal parts? Um, the top, the top or the middle right hand, left hand side, um, this is a CNC. Um, you know, fully automated uh, dowel, a uh, drill inserter machine. This particular one also does lock dowel. Um, and lock dowel is a great fastening system. It's used in the closet industry quite a bit. Um, and you might have a setup where, hey, listen, I have a three access machine. We had a commercial business, we want to do closets. We're all set up, you know, for lock dowel or for boring, because that's what we have. We have a CNC boring machine, our three axis CNC, which takes care of all the face operations and all our edge operations on this particular machine. Top right is a CNC machining center where you're going to take a part that's cut on your slider, on your vertical panel saw, on your beam saw. You're going to take that dimension part to that CNC machining center. It's going to grab the part, pull it in, and now that is going to do all your grooving, face drilling, edge drilling, all the way around the part. You know, so pretty awesome, higher production. Um, but if that's the equipment you have or you want to use, it, or you have that beam saw, and maybe you want to add something like this to new closets, that's certainly another route. And then the traditional pot and rail machine center, where again you can do edge work and face work to dimension panels. Uh, you're not necessarily going to dimension your panels on that machine. So, how are you going to assemble your closet systems? An important thing to realize about closet systems, um, typically, not every single time, they tend to be 32 millimeter system based. Um, the um, 32 millimeter system base, um, and you have to do all your hole. We, we drill only the holes needed, which is an option, I think, in, all, in almost all software packages. We don't create a hundred sides that are white metal, meaning 15 inches deep, you know, 84 inches tall with our continuous line board. And we, we drill for a fixed shelf and fasteners, we drill for drawer slides, we drill for adjustable shelves. The adjustable shelves are the cluster of eight holes on them. Um, most of our closet systems go to the floor and are seven feet tall. Um, the top two fasteners here can be fully machined on a three axis machine like we have. Uh, the top left is a Cabaneo fastener. Very cool fastener. We switched to this during COVID and supply train issue, chain issues because we can no longer get the uh, nickel break fix housings that we were using. Uh, we chose to use the nickel because we felt that there weren't enough color choices in the plastic housings that we could make a good match to some of the materials we were using. And 90% of the time we found we were using nickel closet rods, nickel handles, so why not nickel right fix? Uh, so we made the switch to the cabinet and we fell in love with it because everything is there. You push that in with one finger, your bolts in there, you can wrap panels up together. There's no scratching, there's no second step of putting the pin in. Um, which is the method we use for the ray fix 
Again, both of these fasteners, all the machining operations happen on the face of your panel. There's no need for edge machining at all. Um, the ready fix, we experimented with putting them in the shop because you're on the bench and it's faster to somebody out in their field on their hands and knees putting in a thousand bolts for the housing. Um, we tried using three quarter inch foam making strips and putting them over, you know, the stuff you buy for insulation at Home Depot, and we squish them down on top of the pins so we could wrap them together so they didn't scratch up. And then we also tried just sending it to the field with a box of pins that people would have to sit there and put them on horses or work on their hands and knees on the bedroom floor, putting in 500 pins for a job. So uh, having everything included in that cabinet has made the difference. And I thought I would have switched back, but probably won't. The next two options are the lock dowel on the lower left, which we spoke a little bit about, require um, both face machining, which was done on, could be done on any, pretty much any CNC, and the edge work. So here you're going to need that CNC um, machine that will do edge boring um, as well as um, face boring. So this might be a situation where you have everything cut up on your big CNC, maybe it's a fly in a high production CNC, and then you're going to take the parts to your machine center and it's going to drill in your lock valves. A very, very simple fastener, great fastening system. The OVO connector is another one that requires edge drilling, but now when I looked last, when I actually had dropped this photo into this presentation, I saw that they did have a version of this fastener that could be machined from the face. I've never used it. It was kind of interesting. Um, but there are a lot of options. These are not all of them. I just wanted you to have some idea of, because I don't know where you all are with, um, the, yes. So, so with your with your current business, you say you're still using one hundred percent the uh, the cabinet, yeah, the, the yeah. top ones, yeah. Because we don't, we, I was going to buy a lockdown machine, and then you know we, we just kept we looked at our space number one, um, and it just it was it was a hard decision, but we decided to stick with what we had, and then now we. Switched to the cabinet, we're quite happy with that. And our custom cabinetry is just a blind dado screw, which is all done on the CNC, and you know, apply it finished end, to the finished end. Um, so this is just a sampling of some of the fasteners, not all the fasteners out there, but you're going to want to think about how we put this together. Uh, another important note is, um, you know, what type of what type of closet are you going to make? Um, we, 95% of the time, make closets that go full height. Full height being eight foot ceiling, seven foot high, nine foot ceiling, we'll go up to a full eight foot or the metric equivalent of that number um, panel. Occasionally, if somebody's, you know, really nice walk-in closet, glass doors, lighting, we'll want to add um, a crown molding, then I have the option to turn off um, 32 millimeter heights that would be the overall height of the closet and let me put in a precise number so that I can calculate any space for a crown molding. But generally, we just stick with a 32 millimeter system. All our numbers are fractional. We don't actually make the guys go through a reading um, metric. I wish they would, but they don't. Um, so, you know, are you gonna build full height closet systems? Are you gonna full, build fully assembled closet system? And how are you gonna hang them? We happen to really enjoy it. The rail and hang brackets. Those hang brackets get mounted to your partitions, right? That would not have back up a little bit. The closet systems are all part based. I mean, the biggest difference you're going to see is you're going to have parts on carts rather than assemblies, right? You're building, it's the same process with building a custom cabinet. It's going to come off the truck, go on the CNC, go through the edge banner, maybe if you have a drill insert a machine, it'll go to that, and it's going to go into assembly, clean up, but then it's going to get assembled, and maybe you're going to add a face frame, and maybe you're going to put doors on it, and maybe you're going to sand and finish it, so you have a lot more steps. Our closets never get assembled, almost never get assembled, um, and we choose to use this uh, rail, which has both in-out adjustment and up-down adjustment, because you have to set your parts level. Um, we do indicate to people, especially we'll show them in our showroom, that we hang the closets level to the high point in the floor. The floor drops off an inch, inch over eight feet. Um, 
build the airspace under there. Um, you don't want to approach closets by going and thinking you're going to start scribing everything because you've got yourself crazy. Um, it's, it's parts generally where if there's a base molding, and 90% of the time there's a base molding, we measure the height of the base molding, the depth of that thickness, depth of that base molding, and a shoe. There's a little parameter on the side of the screen, you enter those numbers, it does a notch with a little bit of breathing room so that the partitions go right in over that baseboard. You're not ripping baseboards out of somebody's closet. We also stay off the wall by that much. Typically, we're off the wall an inch. Um, that allows for walls to not be straight. Again, this is, I can build a walk-in dressing room. Let's say it's got 10 feet of double hanging and it's got a, a two drawer section, his and hers, with doors above it and doors on everything. And crown wood. That's a cabinet job, but we could be spending sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. I can build the same functioning closet system that looks beautiful probably a third of that price, and make more profit on that than I will the cabinet job. And it'll be through my shop so I can do the next one. So it, it, it just works as long as you don't get crazy with it. You can certainly say, hey, if you don't like this, like this you can buy a molding package to trim around the floor and to fill in the gaps between the side of the panel and the wall, but very, very few people ask for that. And there are some, that want a closet system, but they want to bring it up. And we just provide that service. It's just your everyday closet, you're, you're, you're gonna to want to go to the field and put this thing in easy and not have any of your interferences. Um, so we use this, there, there's many people, go ahead. I was gonna ask when you do um, the gut trim mm -hmm. at the bottom of floor material, like mm -hmm. either a topic or baseboard, or yep. um, what do you do if it's hanging and not touching the floor, there's just still a gap under the floor. Well, if, we, if they don't want a trim package, then then there will be a little space under the partition. If they do want a, a trim package, then we'll just bring in, we'll either make up just a square edge piece of material and the same material with the closet, or we can buy a TFL coated um, base molding, and we'll just wrap around the entire closet. Um, so it will cover it. And sometimes, because closet systems, are, if we go to the floor, so we have a toe kick, right? So each three quarter inch partition goes to the floor. So I mean, if you start following that around the entire closet, that's going to cut you. And little three quarter inch wide pieces that have a miter on both sides, dangerous. So we will we'll bring that, that toe kick that we put in up, you know, maybe a half inch under the inside of the bottom shelf so that we can just cover over that that recess for the toe kick. Um, there are other ways, a lot of seen people use cleats. Actually, if anybody stayed in the hotel, they had suspended closets in those little guest rooms and they were half hung on the wall with a cleat system or a nailer. Um, again, it's how your operation is set up. There's no right way or wrong way. You just want to set it up efficiently. And again, just remember, you're, you're handling a lot of parts now rather than assembly. So you, know, you, you have to think about organization do I need a showroom? Um, that's a typical closet for us. This one we used when we used to do uh, home shows, you know, consumer home shows at the local uh, uh, Civic Center or whatever. Uh, we now put it into our showroom. To, we had a hunting, a hunting and fishing store, and basically a modern frameless kitchen with you know the horizontal wall that frame, which is popular. Uh, garage systems, garages are taking off now. We do a lot of slab wall. Uh, we just became a dealer for Swiss Tracks, which is a garage floor system, um, which we really liked because we did not want to get into grinding floors and putting down epoxies and nothing. I just, I wanted it easy. Easy, and if something goes wrong, I pick up a piece and put in a new piece. Um, and then we have a traditional face frame inset shaker door on the other kitchen. And a place where we can meet with clients, a large screen monitor, um, which which the showroom has turned out great. I mean, we bring 90% of our customers come into the showroom. Um, they come there, they're in your house, which is kind of nice, especially when you're making a sale. You know, you're on your own turf a little bit. Um, people love seeing the space, and now you always get, oh, you make cabinets too? Um, so there's a lot of cross-selling. It's 
tremendous amount. We hand out both cards when we go out to a client's house because there's always cross-selling to do. So one company helps the other. Uh, and we do our presentation on that monitor. We show them materials, we take them on a shop tour, and again, even with architects and builders, it's like, oh, you actually make this stuff? Um, so it, people are always really happy to see that you're actually manufacturing local. Um, it's a very hot item right now to manufacture local. You know, the, 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 the foot, carbon footprint is lower. Um, people are excited to be able to stop in and, and say hi and see how things are going. Sometimes that's good, sometimes it's not. Um, but generally it's good, most times it's good. So the showroom has been awesome. Um, if you have a space, once you get involved in it and you're comfortable with your closet system, I would definitely consider having a showroom if you don't have one. I think it's important, especially in the closet industry. So, planning the process. If you have a dream, you want to start a closet business. A customer has a dream, they want a closet. So right there, you got a good marriage. Um, so you have to decide you know, what machinery you have, maybe you're gonna supplement or change or keep what you have, how you're gonna assemble them, so we've looked at some of that. Then you're gonna design them. So, you don't have to make your own closet parts, you can certainly go buy closet parts from me or anybody else here who has a CNC or your local manufacturer um, and just do the design. And the chances are, no matter how you approach your closet business, you're gonna need design software. I mean, KCDW, Cabinet Vision 2020, Closet Pro, there are a bunch of them out. Yes? I need to keep cutting off. <laughs> so, first of all, I'm newly into cabinetry, so mm -hmm. I've been using Mosaic. Okay. Um, Mosaic. I mean, is there a particular design package that you find more favorable or specific for the closet? I can't say. I can't play favorites. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, it's just easier. I mean, because, you know, if you run, like, I operate the CNC, you got a couple CNCs, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with five different pieces of software right now. You know, you got I know design no, software, motion. I mean, I, for people getting into the closet business, I know that uh, Closet Pro um, people people really I, I, it's a family that owns it. I mean, it's a, it, it's a great team, and frankly, I even looked at it even though I have cabinet vision and I love it. Used it since the '90s. Um, I even considered looking, you know, maybe buying buying that for the closets just because it, it handles it so well. I mean, that's, I have never used it, but certainly from people that I know that have, it's, that's very popular, but they're all good. And closets, I can teach somebody the process of designing and drawing a closet on our system, probably in a day or two. It's just a different animal when you bring, you know, it's, it's, it's quicker. It's not like designing and building custom assemblies division or whatever software you have to use. So you have your design done. Another break from cabinet making, we don't draw custom cabinetry before we sell the job. We get drawings from an architect or from a homeowner or a sketch and we take that information, we put it into a separate software program that we do estimates in and we give them a price if we get a, a contract and a check sign. We then do the drawings. In the closet business, you're gonna be drawing your jobs before you sell them. That's what everybody else does. There are some who have tried and I've experimented, especially clients that are further away from our shop geographically, um, charging a, basically, con I call it a consultation fee. We'll come out, we'll measure, we'll meet with you, um, we'll bring the, the information back to the shop, do the drawing and proposal and present it to you. If you move forward, you get that feedback or apply it towards your job. If you don't, then that's it. And well, jobs that are sort of outside, we'd like to stay within an hour of the shop. Um, and even that number, if somebody says, I have a reach-in, and when they fill out a lead form, there's $2,500, 25 to 5,000, five to 10, 10 to 20, 20 plus. Um, if somebody puts, everybody puts $2,500 down. Um, if somebody, wants to, you know, has the $2,500 closet and they're 45 minutes away, I'm three, you know, three hours and it draws up four hours or into this job and six, seven hundred bucks and it's a $2,500 closet. So we sort of have that as a minimum and those jobs that are further away, I'll either A, 
talk to them about the consultation fee to cover a little bit of our expenses, or B, ask them if they could send us some information about the plot, some photographs, maybe some rough dimensions, and we draw it and present it on Zoom. And if the price is agreed upon, then we'll go out and measure. But you have to be a little bit careful. You're gonna to, probably gonna set a minimum price because you can only you can't do too much running around for a small job. So design software is very important, and then build it. You're not gonna build these things in your shop. You're gonna assemble them in the field. Again, they're all parts based. Um, one, I say we don't build them in the shop except for our drawer sections. We decided it was a lot easier. If we used a uh, Hafla Slim. Yeah. Hefla Slimbox A, uh, Hefla Move It, there's Bloom has drawer systems. We, we like the metal drawer systems, fully adjustable, soft closed. We do that in the shop just so that drawers are built, the slides are mounted in the holes where the CNC drill them, and we can just double check to make sure everything's where we want it. Because if, it, if it's not right, I mean, generally what you see is what you get out of these software packages and CNCs, but if it's not the way you want it, it's so easy to fix it in the shop. Or we make a part versus when you're getting to the field. Plus, the guys in the field are just focused on. They go in, everything's numbered. Let's say we have, we'll look at three sections wide. We have part A, which is a partition, part B, a double hanging section, we'll wrap, and then part three, another partition. We'll wrap part one and three together, stretch wrap them. We'll take that center section, which is number two, wrap those parts. The guys will go in, they'll start setting all the partitions in the room, take their measure get it to the right approximate distance and then unwrap those pieces and then stick them all and lock them into place. Um, so you're handling a lot of parts, generally not built in the shop except for our drawer systems because we want the guys to be able to fly through this when they get to the field. Um, money, when, when we go, we charge 60% up front, 40% um, when we say we're here with the closets not when we're not installing the closets. Because you're gonna hate chasing somebody for the thousand dollars <coughs> due on their $2,500 closet. Um, there are people who charge 100% up front. Um, you're gonna wanna change up your price structure. Bigger closet, it's still a percentage when we knock on the door, but I might not even have a progress. You know, if there's a $50,000 closet job, I might put the progress payment in there too, in the middle of it. Although getting 60% up front pretty much covers not having to do that. Because as you'll see, there's, there's a much better profit margin with the closets. This is a sample of um, defining the process. Uh, this is our basically front end. This is gonna take you right up to the point where we're gonna hit manufacturing. How am I doing on time? Because I know it's a long window. Yeah, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay. Um, so, very high level here, the marketing progress, uh, process. So Facebook ads, so we use a uh, very inexpensive app online called Canva. Canva is wonderful, and I have a, there's a sheet at the last page of this where you're gonna be able to um, look at all the names of these software. Canva, you're gonna create, um, you're gonna make all your creative content for your ads. They have wonderful graphics for, that are seasonal, holidays, um, even if you don't have good pictures, maybe you need some closet pictures, or maybe you want somebody in a boutique department store, and you know, it could be your closet, not the department store kind of a picture. It, it's nice canvas, pull that stuff. I have a pro version, and I think it's seven dollars a month. And most of it's free. So we create our creative. We have some photos. Maybe we have some twenty-second videos, which we can use for reels on Facebook and Instagram. Um, and then we also do email marketing um, as well as Google Ads, which is a little bit, you don't know what you're doing, like $100 bills and fanning them out, but it, it does work eventually. Um, the next thing is the sales process. So customer says, yep, I signed out your lead form. The lead form comes in the HubSpot. HubSpot is a CRM sales software suite that does everything for everybody. It's a, it's a little bit over coming sometimes, but you can do a lot with it. You can automate some of these processes. So it comes in, we see the leads in HubSpot, we send an initial email, that's touch one. We usually, and that usually we try to get out immediately when we see it pop up. We usually call within 24 hours to follow that email if they haven't responded. 
Next thing we do is we set an appointment. So that moves to what HubSpot calls a deal. Um, once that appointment scheduled um, task is done, then it automates the next half a dozen or so tasks where basically go to the job site, meet with a customer, do a drawing, yeah, yeah. schedule an appointment to get the customer to come into the shop. If they can come in or they don't want to, then we'll do the, we'll do the presentation via Zoom. Um, Which email campaign are you using? So we do it right. Through, yeah, we do it right through HubSpot, and then we'll also do a newsletter. We're supposed to do a newsletter. We try to do a newsletter. Um, so once they come in, um, we'll follow up. Yeah, we'll send them home with a proposal. We do not give away our drawings. Um, some people are very pushy about it, and we'll say, "Fine, the drawings are five hundred dollars, or maybe fifteen hundred dollars, depending on the size of the project." Um, people will go shopping. Right, there's competition out there. It's a different competition than you're used to in the, in the at least in our custom cabinet making space. I know there are people maybe who do more stock, you know, where there's a lot of competition and pressure on price. We don't necessarily feel the pressure on our price with the custom cabinets, so we don't we do not hand away the drawings, except when we do, and that's usually when there's a customer in there. And everybody's done this long enough. You have a feeling that this is a real job. And maybe you send them home with a 3D view or two so that they can just dream about their space. And you, know, you can tell, but generally as a, as a habit, because first thing somebody, oh, just send me the drawings. We get that email all the time. And it's like, no, it's like you can set up a Zoom review if you can't come in, but don't send out your drawings. You've done the work, they're not free. Even if you don't get the job, at least you've captured that marketing contact that you can remarket to and send newsletters to, because they did click on your Add for some reason. Um, all right, so we've got the contract out. They say yes, then it goes into the documentation process, which is just your contract, deposit schedule, certificates of inclusion, uh, improvement, and then it kicks over to Asana. Asana is where the shop takes over. We have a process set up in Asana where it's basically the engineer gets refined, shop drawings are made, everything goes into a binder, a book. It has usually color rendering on front of the closet. It will usually have a color-coded sticker on it. There'll be a thumb drive that's the same color as that sticker. Um, in the book will be all the CNC nesting programs. In our case, it'll have the both hardware and material order that was produced for the job. Uh, it'll also have drawings, 11 by 17, which fold in half beautifully in a regular notebook binder. Um, so that binder just follows the job to the whole shop. Um, and it works very nice. It's, it's probably got half the steps as my process does for custom cabinetry. Um, both of them run through Asana. If anybody wants to ask me about Asana, I know it, it can get expensive. Um, I've sort of stopped at five people because after that it gets expensive, but I'm so used to using it, I don't want to change. So, what do you need to prepare for? Increase pace, pace, pace for customers. This is the reality. When we started marketing, I, I mean, when I took a growth plan last, I went back up again, 2021, I had this completed process, you know, documented process for creating our marketing plan. Wasn't using it yet, finished paying off the marketing firm because we had these four huge jobs, you know, for us, think about the size of the shop, it was over a million dollars. Um, they were chomping to go, and I was like, can't bury us, we gotta perform on these jobs. And come August, I said, this is not, these aren't going anywhere because of the zoning boards, you know, everything was shut down, you couldn't get materials, all the stuff that went on during COVID. So we said, fine, I started using our marketing plan. Um, by December, had to sort of throttle it back. We were so buried, I had hired a full-time designer to help me because I couldn't keep up with it. Um, so it worked, and that's my guerrilla tactics. Um, you know, I can't imagine actually hiring somebody to do it for me. I'd love to imagine it because I don't know if I necessarily enjoy it. It's, it's just another thing to do at this point. It was fun in the beginning. So, great, we got all these customers. We went, on, we went analog after we went nuts last winter. 
um, and put up this good old fashioned magnetic board that basically has uh, schedule appointment, you know, do drawings, do proposal, bring the client in, da, 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 all the way down to the point, you know, send out contract, payment received, payment received, this was a painful one. We were rocking and rolling. We're just like, this is great. Two of us are running meetings. I've got my cabinets are flying, and lo and behold, I called Mrs. Smith. Your job was all done. Well, you never signed the contract. It happened twice. One job was nine thousand dollars. Luckily, they were nice enough to accept the two thousand dollar discount and have their closet because I, I kind of shoved it down their throat. They never. The contract was sent. They said, send us a contract. You know, it got translated, the job is sold. I was excited because we were trying to keep four to six weeks. We drifted to six to eight weeks. We were working on drifting to eight to 10 weeks. And I was trying to keep my customers happy. So I was get, I was jumping again, getting ahead of it. And it was expensive. Um, the other customer wanted nothing to do with it. And they said, you can use this on the next person's closet. And I'm like, no, they're custom. Really, they are custom. We use bits and pieces of it. but. They were basically taking up cart space and in the way for six months before I said, take them home or put them in the dumpster. <laughs> Which happens. But, you know, sometimes going old school, when I walk into my space where my chair is, this smacks me in the face each day. So I have some idea of where I'm at. So hopefully I actually have money before I build somebody's closet. Parts on carts. Another thing you want to do is make sure your customer is ready when they say they're going to be ready. That little assembly of carts stuck around, and there's another one behind me. This is my finishing room, and there's some more out in the assembly room, and there's some more in the machine room. They stuck around for three months. Okay, so language in your contract about being ready when you are. That means if you're not uninstalling what's there, they have to have it cleaned out. If they want to fix the holes in the wall because they see the wall, that they need to get the walls fixed and painted. Right, that, that they need to be ready for you. You've committed to be ready for them. It goes both. That's an important one. Um, they did pay me. I mean, they paid me immediately. It's, yeah. it's, there's a delay. It was a modular home, and it wasn't being dropped on time, but it happens. Um, there's a little, we'll walk over here, a little two-second improvement that one of my employees, actually my CNC operator, came out of the Navy. Part of the closet process was the simplification of what we did. So I was able to start looking for employees that weren't necessarily cabinet makers. So I hired this guy that was an aircraft mechanic on a carrier and was working at the local municipal airport and hated it. And he interviewed for the job and I gave it. And he came up with this idea. Everything has a tag and a label on it. But when I got 30 carts full of the same white melamine or gray or whatever it happens to be, he said, well, I'll just write a name it was stick it out of the same material it's made out of, stick it up on top of the cart, and I can just walk through the room and see what jobs are on those carts. So awesome, two second improvement that probably save an hour a week. So lots of parts on carts, increased mach yeah, machine usage. So my CNC in the first 12 years had just under 2,000 hours on it, and it was my ATM machine. So there's like 2,000, that's a 40 hour week for one year. 12 years. That's the machine time actually cutting. In the past four years, I've probably put another 1,000 hours on it. So we're still not maxed out, but you're going to use the machine more. So luckily, being in the Air Force and a mechanic, he was awesome at maintenance and maintaining equipment like I do because I like to keep everything shiny and new looking forever. I hate buying new equipment. Um, more install technicians, right? So instead of now, look at us. Instead of sending out maybe 10, 12 jobs, big jobs a year, maybe we're sending out 10, 12 a month. Maybe you'll get up to 10, 12 a week. There's a there's a different pace there, um, and you're going to maybe need a second install crew, uh, second van, um, first van, because maybe you've just hired a truck to deliver stuff for you when you're just sending out a job once a month. So just just things to consider as you grow your business. On the plus side, better cash flow. You know, so we're doing our cabinet. Now you get you know, four or five closets go out. There's four or five checks on the desk every day, which is nice. You know, click with your telephone. The next morning, it's in your bank account. We prefer to be paid with checks. We will pay credit cards. Um, that is by PayPal. I don't even want to put a machine. You know, people's like, 
you want to take credit cards? Sure, it's 3%. Um, I had one guy do a $75,000 deposit, and I said, it's 3%. This is all like the points. And it's like, okay. It's quite a point system. Um, so you just have to be prepared, prepared for that growth and that cadence the, the cadence or this, the pace change. So show me the money. Why did you do this, right? Because you all want to make more money. So two important facts to help you with this decision. I'm going to read the slide. The first year that we produce closets, our closet sales represented 10% of our gross revenue and 40% of our net. And like, whoa, you weren't charging enough for your cabinets. Okay, if we were one of four people bidding a cabinet job and number four or five were high, the high bidders, we were four or five all the time. Um, what it did make me realize and what we've started to get better is all those cabinet jobs that we didn't sell half ago came in in July. So now we, we had, I had to teach non-cabinet makers, or not non-traditional cabinet makers, how to sort of move from closets to cabinets. Um, we started working on simplifying the process, process for our custom cabinetry, which, um, you know, some of the guys have great ideas not coming from the industry, having no real idea of traditional assembly methods. Uh, it worked out very well for us. Uh, during the summer of 2020, we implemented our marketing plan. plan. Since then, our, so our closet sales have grown by 300%, and we're on pace this year to have our revenue grow by over 100% in the fiscal year. And the cool thing is, is during COVID, and the closets were rocking because everybody was home and they needed places to put stuff. Everybody was putting stuff in storage and closets. So we were booming and people were hiring us. And we found that we ran 16 months up through July and we sold those big cabinet jobs. We ran 16 months straight without a single cabinet job and then trailing 16 months, that was the best 16 month period we ever had. Both total revenue and total profit. Um, so it certainly has been a good journey. And the fact that this is all process driven I think personally that Paul and Closet Company, or whatever you call it yourselves in the future, if you have some idea of succession, that that brand or that business is going to be so much easier to sell compared to XYZ woodworking or Taconic woodworking. It's less about you, more about the process and people you have in place. So that's it. Um, I want to thank everybody. Uh, two things. Get involved, right? Like I'm standing here telling everybody about my experience with this transition. The Cabinet Maintenance Association, I've been a member for a dozen or more years. I served as president on the board. Um, they absolutely had a great deal to do with me standing here today and, and growing my personal self and my business self. The <coughs> Association of Closet and Storage Professionals, another awesome organization. There is networking and support for anybody who wants to venture into this. Right? You don't have to do it on your own. There are people out there with another dozen ways of doing it besides what I've told you here today. But there's in it, it's the best money you'll spend. you'll spend. They're both inexpensive for what you get out of them. Again, like anything, even like software, you get out of it what you put into it. Um, serving on the boards has been just a wonderful experience with the number of people I've gotten to know and the number of friends I've gained in my adult life. Um, and then below that we have some of the software um, and marketing materials that I spoke about. Yes, sir. Question, Leland. Uh, do you, you talked about design, but most of the design was related to uh, production and, and all. Uh, do you get into personal organization design or any of that stuff with the closets? Is that a value add that you can do or that helps enhance your project? Be, be prepared for what you might walk into. I mean, I, I, have, I have gone in some places and I, had, I said, actually did a cartoon once where the woman opens the door and there's smoke in the closet and shoes all over the floor and she says, I think I need a new closet. And basically my closet exploded. And literally, I've walked into those kinds of closets. And that's, 
I don't think I've ever directly said that, but people say it's it's never all going to fit in here, and we could be talking about a ten foot reach in right now. So what do you have? You have a shelf, and you have ten linear feet of single hanging space, right? And the floor, if you don't want to throw shoes and boxes on the floor, but it's cluttered, it's messy. And there's, okay, that same closet, you know, even if you have your little wing walls, you, you put your hanging left and right, right? Because it's very easy to reach in there and slide clothes, your clothes up. So you put in three feet, I said eight feet, so let's do the math there, three feet of double hang. Okay, so now you have six feet of that eight foot rod, right? On the other side, you do two feet, of long hanging for a shelf for five. So now you have a shelf, you also have a nice pretty deck on the floor that they put their shoes on, and you're gonna have long hanging there. So now we're up to the eight feet. Then maybe you do a little shoe section or you do a nice three foot drawer section in the middle, especially if they're bifold drawers. A lot of those eight foot closets tend to be bifolds, so the drawers can be in the middle. And now you have a drawer stack with shelves above it. This is the same closet that just had a shelf and eight feet of closet rod. People are just like, oh my God. I mean, I've, I've seen so many happy clients with, with just how organized their life has gotten. And to that note, um, you know, with the help of uh, the Association of, Association of Closet and Storage Professionals, um, I have started to do some networking with professional organizers, which is a, a great avenue because they have a need for us, we have a need for them. Uh, we're also now starting to work more to see if we can start developing some relationships locally uh, with multifamily. Uh, the city of Poughkeepsie is not too far from us. We hopefully will get a job that we just bid for Vassar College for the uh, faculty housing, which is 80 of the identical reaching closets. You know, they put a pole and a shelf in there, and they were like, oh, no, that's not what we agreed to. We need something nicer than this. So they had to use the local closet company and there was Paul in closet, so there's lots of space to expand, yes. So, is there anything from a, being a closet specialist in terms of material? Um, because I know MDF comes in different densities, or right? are there anything that, you know, because I'm totally new to closets, mm -hmm. or, you know, doesn't matter? Okay, so the density of the material hasn't been so much of an issue, I would say, you know, to, to keep it really pure and simple, you'll want to stick with TFL panels. MDF, we do once in a while do, I don't know if you're familiar with Shinoki, which is a product out of Holland. It's, it, it's a beautiful veneer. Um, it's it's pre-dyed. It's a dead flat finish on it. It's gorgeous. We use it for kitchen cabinet doors. Shinoki. Um, so as, you know, for a really high-end closet, that might just be a wonderful look. We do occasionally say with people, that I want to paint my closet. And I found that people are very accepting if you give them a price for painting because you just don't want to move all the stuff out of your spray booth, all the storage space now. Um, that, you know, we'll make it, we'll install it, and we, you know, you can have a painter, you can paint it yourself. You know, this is how much if we paint it, they're like, it's more than the closet. Yes, it is more than the closet. So um, we do occasionally get into painting closets, but then what I'll do is I'll show people some of these uh, PET surfaces. Um, you know, recycled plastics, um, the ultra mats, some of those ultra glass, uh, ultra gloss finishes. Um, so why do you want to paint it? You use these materials. So you can find very high end materials to use in your closets and, and teach people that they don't need to go back to the traditional cabinets that they're thinking about necessarily. That your real efficiency comes to that, taking advantage of the automation in your business and a very simple process. And again, you can make it as complicated as you want, but that just is going to slow your pace down. Um, 